is the political beatdown with Michael Cohen and Ben Micellis. On this episode, we're going to talk as much as he possibly can about Michael Cohen testifying before the criminal grand jury in Manhattan. This is the Manhattan District Attorney's criminal investigation of Donald Trump. Cohen testified on Monday, I believe. He's got some other news of when he's set to testify. Again, we will talk more about that here on Political Beatdown. Uh, in response uh, to Cohen's testimony, Trump's lawyers have been nonstop attacking <laughs> Michael Cohen. They've been, I, I don't know, have they been, they, they've been trying to show the world what their defense is going to be, if you could even call it that, where they go, no affair, it's extortion. So I want to see if we can get Cohen to respond as much as he can to those statements being made by those idiots, I mean lawyers. We'll we'll talk more about that. Um, and Donald Trump just completely unhinged on his social media platform, posting these incredibly bizarre and deranged videos. He's like making videos of himself for the prosecutors or for his base. And he did this unhinged event in Iowa. This and more here on the political beatdown. Everyone wants to hear from you, Michael Cohen, about recent developments, of course. So welcome, Michael Cohen. Oh, it's it's always to good to see you there, Ben. Always good to see you. You know what I love? Uh, you and I both today in the hoodies. You know, it's a li I, you know, Ben, people don't know this, but Ben happens to be in New York, so we will get together. But New York's a little cold right now. You know, there's a little snow flurry and so on. So everybody's running around in their um in their hoodies. Mine's nice and comfy. I happen to love it. So all right, listen. Let me snow be very flurries clear. outside, but things are heating up, Michael Cole. Oh, thing, things are very things are very hot in New York City right now. Look, let me say this. Um it's not news that I was in the grand jury uh, yesterday. They asked me to come back. In fact, it's not by ask. It's by subpoena. And so I am obligated, regardless of the fact I would have showed up anyway. But they treated me the same way they treated everybody else. And everything is via subpoena. So I'm going back in tomorrow. Uh, I expect it should be approximately as long as I spent the last time, which is a three-hour time period. Uh, and that will be it for me. And then it'll be, of course, up to Alvin Bragg. It'll be up to this grand jury to make a determination whether or not they see fit to formally indict, which would be the very first time ever in U.S. history that a president has been or a former president has been indicted. Other than that, I, I really, at this point in time, I cannot discuss any of the topics or the issues or the questions that were asked of me. One of the things I feel I feel fine in terms of discussing is the ongoing nonsensical attacks by Trump counsel or whatever you, as Ben said, whatever you want to call these fools. And in regard to my credibility, this is all right out of the Donald J. Trump playbook, the same playbook that I told Jim Jordan when I was sitting before the House Oversight Committee. I know what you're doing. I know the playbook that you're running because I actually wrote it. So don't try to run it on me because it doesn't make any sense. You got guys like Takapina. This is guy is an ass fucking clown. And then you got Alina Haba, who's just another in case you want to, I don't know, increase the size of your parking garage by adding additional, you know, lifts, you know, to increase the number of cars that you can that she's perfect. Short of this, they're both out of their, they're both out of their lane. And let them make whatever defense arguments they are entitled to. One of the nice things that Lanny said when we were sitting before that gaggle, and that gaggle was crazy. You know, when we got there, there were like 20 reporters with cameras. And so when we left, there was over 100. These, these reporters, you know, it was rainy. It was gross out. They're tripping over each other because we're all underneath the, um, the scaffold that's up over there. It was absolute nightmare and a shit show. Suffice it to say, Lanny said the right thing. At this point in time, Donald has not been indicted and everyone is entitled to the presumption of innocence. Whatever the you know grand jury makes the determination to do here, that's what will ultimately happen. I feel very confident in Alvin Bragg's team. 
to be honest with you. I feel very, very comfortable with them. They are incredibly, incredibly well-versed. Uh, they have all the information at their fingertips, and they are doing an extraordinary, extraordinary job. As far as I can say, now I don't know, I wasn't obviously involved in anybody else's testimony, but as far as mine goes, they're doing an extraordinary job in laying out the case. So, Cohen, before you went and gave this grand jury testimony on the first day on Monday, you're going to go back for another day on Wednesday, you had met 20 times right. with the Manhattan District Attorney's Office. Can you maybe just kind of walk us through, for those who are kind of just tuning in now New or maybe brigade. living in a bunker, yes. you know, <laughs> can you tell them maybe that process maybe where there was a time period where your confidence in the process was being tried and how it was restored? Because sure. I think explaining that process to people who don't necessarily know it from the inside is important and gives them confidence in this process. So the very first time that I met with members of the DA's team, we call them Danny, D-A-N-Y, District Attorney of New York, um, I was an inmate at Otisville Federal Correctional Institute. I received a phone call from Lanny, who turned around, Lanny Davis, and he turned around and said to me that the district attorneys um, of New York would like to send a team up to come speak to you, if that would be okay. And I said, sure, you know, why not? They came. Uh, we had a very long conversation which then led to their request for a second and then a third um, meeting. Again, all of the time, you know, being over at um, Otisville. Then when I was ultimately released, and again, this would be subsequent to my unconstitutional remand, I then met with uh, Cyrus Vance's team that was led by Mark Pomerantz and Carrie Dunn two extraordinary attorneys. Um, in fact, I mean, in, in extraordinary is really the only way to describe uh, the two of them and their team, equally extraordinary group of prosecutors. I met with them 10 times over the course of about two years. Now, uh, um, Cyrus Vance makes a determination that he's not going to run for re-election and Enter the race is Alvin Bragg. Obviously, that's who wins the district attorney's seat. And at first, I heard absolutely nothing from them until ultimately a determination was made that they were putting the case on hold. And nobody really knew the reason. There were a lot of speculation um, that was running through the media. A lot of people were, of course, very upset because, you know, a lot of people want to see this man, meaning Donald J. Trump, held accountable for whatever it is that he may or may not have done. If he did something wrong, we want to see him like what would happen to you or me. You want to see him held accountable. Ultimately, what ends up happening uh, is Mark Pomerantz comes out with his book. He starts hitting the television. And some people are saying that that was sort of the impetus for Alvin Bragg to jump on and decide to proceed forward. And I would say I don't agree with that. I think Alvin Bragg had elected to review this case on his own time schedule and under his own terms. And when he ultimately made the decision that he was going to pursue this case further, let me say that he has pursued this case as expeditiously as anyone possibly could have, uh, not just with me. He, I be, according to the New York Times now, there have been like seven people who have um, been before the grand jury, from David Pecker to Dylan Howard to Kellyanne Conway, Hope Hicks, um, myself. Uh, let's see, I mean, and I don't know, se several others. I would have to, oh, yeah, uh, you have... Uh, the guy from Mazers, Don Bender. Uh, there's there's approximately seven or eight people that have now appeared before the grand jury. Uh, oh, yeah. You also have, you know, sometimes when you get my age, you know, it's called the senior moment. You also had Deborah Tarasoff. You had 
Jeff McConney. There goes the eight. Um, he's doing this. His team is doing this as professionally, expeditiously, and as lawyerly as could be done by anyone. And I do have to say that he is the district attorney of New York. He had to do this on his own time schedule to the point that he felt comfortable that if an indictment would be issued, that he has to be the one who signs off on it, and he's the one who has to be comfortable with it. And so, again, um, we're not at that stage yet, but if that's what happens, just know, just know that he has looked at every aspect of this case from soup to nuts and will pursue it to the extent you know, legally possible. And look, when Mark Pomerantz and Carrie Dunn resigned, um, there was a period of time when you were also, and rightfully so, and, and lots of people were very skeptical and or critical of what the Manhattan District Attorney's Office was doing. It had seemed that Cy Vance had been building this case brick by brick methodically with this great team of lawyers. Indeed, that's what, what was taking place. And then it seemed to the public a new team had arrived and a new team just didn't see it that way. And so for a lot of people who all feel very strongly and rightfully so that with Donald Trump's traitorous presence, with him just flouting and mocking our justice system each and every day, it really tugged at our hearts that, oh no, he's not going to be held accountable. And Alvin Bragg, what is going on? But one of the things that was very comforting for the brigade and people who actually watched, you know, when you went to that 15th appearance, which I believe was the first time before Alvin Bragg, and I asked you, I said, how do you feel? You know, when you were like, you know what, I'm, I like this team in the sense I'm confident in this team, but we'll see. And then the 16th and then the 17th where then you, you, you arrived on that journey with the brigade telling everybody, look, right. this is a great team. So it's really incredible that they got to live that experience with you and you really shared it in real time as those feelings evolved within you. You know, it's funny, Ben, because I felt like so many people in this country, I felt lost. There was no transparency that was occurring. Um, we didn't know legitimately why um, that Cy Vance elected not to file the indictment before leaving. We didn't really know why Alvin Bragg decided that he was going to take a step back put this on hold, review it under his own terms, on his own time schedule. We didn't know it. And you're right. You know, the media had built this case up that it was imminent. It was imminent under Cy Vance. Well, truth be told, it, it wasn't. And while I was extremely critical of Alvin Bragg before, I do have to say, and I have said it, and I will continue to say it, I was not elected district attorney of New York. None of us were other than Alvin Bragg. And if he's the one who's putting his signature on a paper for a novel case, this is a first time precedented, unprecedented case of a former president potentially being indicted. If Donald Trump is indicted, it will be the first time in U.S. history that a former president has ever been indicted. So this is no... You know, this is not just a willy-nilly type of a scenario. This is one that you best be sure, especially knowing that it's Trump who intends to fight everything. Now, we're going to get into the fact that he's fighting with not the A team, not the B team, not the C team. I mean, they're barely the D team, right? I mean, you know, you're fighting, as I've said, an incredibly incredibly intelligent, well-organized, and proficient group of prosecutors under the, you know, under the control of Alvin Bragg. And, you know, I'm not really sure what Donald is doing, nor do I particularly care. You know, stay with these folks because they're perfect for him. In fact, I don't think anybody of real significance would actually represent this traitorous bastard in the first place. So 
It is what it is. Let them continue to do it. All they know how to do is to shit talk. They're a bunch of television tough guys that thinks by texting nonsense and bullshit and saying nasty things about me that it actually changes anything. Truth be told, my brigaders, it doesn't mean a goddamn thing. All it means is that they look like they're fucking weak. They smell of fear. And that's exactly what's going on here. They know that there's documentary evidence. They know there's emails, text messages. There's a whole slew of information that corroborates every single statement that I made. So the fact that they're just following Donald's playbook, which is, again, one that I was partially responsible for drafting. Yeah, denigrate Michael Cohen. Turn around and say he's a convicted liar. You know, what bothered me the most, you may have seen my my Twitter feed, at Michael Cohen 212 Paula Reed, for example, was one of these, you know, talking heads. You know, she's a lawyer. She's on CNN. She decided that she was going to turn around and call me in her short segment on it, you know, twice. The convicted liar, right? The, uh, you know, the, the convicted felon. I mean, she sounds like she's Donald, right, with just worse laminates. I've never seen anything like it, especially coming from CNN that's now you know, gone right of center for whatever reason. Maybe they think they're going to pick off the Fox viewers that are sick of them. That's why you need to come to Midas, right? That's why you need to come to the Midas Network, uh, the Midas Touch Network, and join us on things like Political Beatdown or Legal AF or the Midas Brothers or any of the other shows because we we are exactly who we are. We're not here to play the game, oh, you know, there's new people that are going to, peel off of Fox because they're angry, you know, um, at, you know, at Fox for um, calling the Arizona election in Biden's favor because Biden actually won. And so let's see if we can not peel these folks off. They're going to lose both. They're losing their own CNN viewership. And worse than that, you know, they're not going to pick up any Fox people. So you got people like um, this Paul Reed who wants to sit there and attack me, convicted liar, convicted liar. The one thing that she doesn't do and she doesn't continue to talk about is what was that conviction even about? It's called the 1001 violation, which is um, a misstatement, a lie to Congress. Well, the big lie, as my brigaders probably already know, is the number of times that I told Congress that I had spoken to Donald about the failed real estate project known as Trump Tower Moscow. I stated in open, you know, in open session that I told Donald about it three times. In fact, I told him about it 10 times. That is the big lie that she wants to call me the convicted liar about, simply because that's how Donald decided he wanted to call me. No different than low energy Jeb or crooked Hillary or Lion Ted or any of the other little Marco or whatever other names that he came up for people. All right. And for some unknown reason, so many of these pundits, these hosts, have decided, especially on the CNN channel, that they are going to use the same words. It's the same words that Joe Tacopina, who's a clown in a half, right? I mean, it, it, you got to look him up and you'll see exactly what I'm saying. This is a wannabe, you know, gangster lawyer that God knows where Trump found this guy in what back alley. It is an absolute joke. But putting all that aside, right? It's, it doesn't inure to their benefit because no different than when I testified live before the House Oversight Committee. If you come with the documents, you come with the receipts, you don't need any more for anyone to believe anything that I say. All right. You don't need to. Why? Because it's backed up by documentary evidence. It's backed up by corroborating testimony, not just by. And Ben, you, you were one of the first people who actually brought this out to the attention of our brigaders. The Southern District of New York actually put it in their statement about me, that Donald Trump directed me to make these payments. It's in the Southern District's documents. So at the end of the day, who's, who's DOJ? Whose DOJ was it? It's Donald's DOJ. Right. They could go with whatever defense they're going to try to cook up the Melania defense, the I'm an idiot defense. Right. I have a mushroom pecker that doesn't work defense. I have no fucking clue what defense this idiot wants to go with. But whatever it is, I'm ready. 
the, the, the defense appears to be no affair, no affair, horse face, no affair, extortion. Which by the way, is by the, the way, most I'm, mis- by the way, it's so ridiculous. By the way, the again, it goes right back to his denigrating then of you know of women. This is that sexist, misogynist you know um, aspect of Donald Trump. What if hypothetically? She's gorgeous. Does that make it any different than if a person in Donald's eyes is not beautiful? First of all, I think Stormy is absolutely a wonderful, she's a wonderful woman. She's she's pretty. Um, she's smart, right? So he has to go ahead and he has to denigrate her. For what reason? Because it makes him and his base feel better. And what does that do? It helps him to grift off of these morons so that they send him money for the legal fund. This is the biggest joke of them all. When I was watching Paula Reed, and we'll we'll play it in a moment, you know, you mentioned, you know, reminds you of Trump. It, it did. It reminded me of Trump. It reminded me of Laura Ingraham. It reminded me of Fox. And it's really sad to see overwhelmingly CNN becoming Fox light. I mean, you compare that to the Midas Touch network here, and it's like, okay, when we're not doing the political beatdown with an actual witness before the grand jury and someone who's gone now 20 times before uh, the Manhattan district attorney, who's our other guest? We had Alvin Bragg actually on the show, Karen Friedman Agnifilo, who hosts the legal show, Legal AF. She was the number two deputy in the entire Manhattan district attorney's office. She was Cy Vance's number two, and she basically ran the office, giving you those perspectives. And the problem, and you pointed this out earlier, Cohen, is these media narratives that feed people this disinformation really creates a situation of kind of chaos and and panic and lies that allow for somebody like a Donald Trump to emerge. And oftentimes, while these media networks will say, oh, we we ignore Donald Trump and, and, and that's why we don't cover him. No, you don't. You know, you, you you do cover him. Here, I'll just pull this up, and I want to talk about this later um, in the show. But this was a headline from the Associated Press. Um, Donald Trump went to Iowa. He gave this completely unhinged, like crazy speech. Like literally, it it seems it was it was this like QAnon conspiracy theory thing. And the headline is Trump returns to Iowa, aiming for a more disciplined campaign. That's what the Associated Press is talking about, which feeds to all of the outlets. And Cohen, to your point, we'll pull up the video now of of Paula Reed. And this is what Paula Reed says on CNN. And it's basically pro-Trump propaganda. It's it's just inaccurate. It's just not true. That's the whole thing. So, yeah, let's let Salty, let's go to the video. (laughs) <laughs> to consider his options after being invited to appear next week before a Manhattan grand jury. The panel is investigating his alleged role in a hush money payment scheme involving adult film star Stormy Daniels. That invitation is a sign that a decision on indicting Trump is probably next. Joining us now, a defense attorney and former federal prosecutor, Shan Wu. Shan, you're the perfect person to talk about this with. I want to start out by talking about the timeline. This investigation has been going on for five years. Suddenly, over the past several weeks, we've seen this uptick in activity in this grand jury. Do we have any idea why now? Uh, no. <laughs> uh, th- th- I'm, one could speculate that there's some public criticism of uh, Bragg after uh, Mark Pomerantz has published his book. Uh, obviously, there's been a lot of publicity about Georgia maybe being the first with Fannie Willis's investigation to indict Trump, but we really don't know. And Alvin Bragg in the past has not shown any appetite for taking on Trump when they had the they had inherited the case from Cyrus Vance, which had been worked up over a course of years on the financial crimes. And Bragg, apparently from public reporting, killed that case. Uh, he went after the organization and took sort of a weak plea from Weisselberg. Um, but now suddenly he seems very interested in pursuing a case that's really been languishing um, for all this time. That's not his fault, um, but the sudden interest, uh, it's mysterious. <laughs> mysterious indeed. Now I also want to talk about another important part of this case, which is Michael Cohen. If they were to indict the former president, he would be a big part of this case. Uh, as it has been widely reported, we know he is a convicted liar. But you've pointed out correctly that plenty of times cooperating witnesses have complicated pasts, previous convictions. But I also want to ask you, I mean, in addition to being a convicted liar, for the past five years, Michael Cohen has run 
to every camera available to disparage his former boss. Is that going to be a problem if he is put on the witness stand? Um, it may or may not be a dispositive problem for conviction, but it certainly gives a lot of ammunition for the defense attorneys to weigh into him in terms of his bias, for one thing, as well, of, of course, as his credibility. Anytime you have a witness who has made a lot of prior statements, it gives the defense some fuel to go after them. And Cohen, as you point out, has been doing nonstop talking on this point, begging for the prosecution to happen. So he'll experience some tough cross-examination. I think on the facts, his timeline has been pretty consistent, though, and he obviously has had a lot of experience testifying under oath, even in Congress. So I think he should hold up well with that. Now, we did invite one of former President Trump's attorneys to come on today. Uh, they declined. But I want to ask you, if you were representing the former president, would you encourage him to go before the grand jury to accept this invitation? Uh, absolutely not. Uh, <laughs> most most defense counsel would not want that to happen. And also, uh, you know, Trump, like many very powerful people, believes himself to be great at handling himself with questions, marketing, making his pitch. It's not like that in the grand jury. He doesn't really have control over what he's being asked. And if he rambles on, he tends to just incriminate himself and look bad. There have been many instances of people, particularly executive types, thinking that they're going to do well in front of a jury or grand jury. And they're usually wrong about that, Paul. Cohen, your so, reaction to that? Yeah, I mean, it was, I mean she was well, just she was just hitting the the, the Trump talking points at the back. Seriously, I, I mean, it's almost like she's on their talking points memos list, and she's just reading right off of it. Which I'm blown away. Good for Sham Wu for putting her in her place. Right? It's amazing to me that she knows nothing about this case. She knows nothing about my case, and yet she's speaking with authority as the host of a show. And to me, saying, I'm running to every single camera. Do you know why I'm doing that? You know why I'm doing that, Ben? I'm doing it so that there's finally accountability, so that I can express to people that Donald Trump weaponized the United States Department of Justice to go against his critic meaning me. It's my book, Revenge. But better than even that, Dan Goldman now, the third member of Congress to speak with Jim Jordan at the Subcommittee on Government Weaponization and calling it out. First, it was um, Congressman Jamie Raskin. God bless him. All right. Then there was Congressman Steve Cohen. And now Congressman Dan Goldman, right? Could you imagine all three of them are I mean, they're juggernauts, and they are all brilliant, brilliant um, lawyers who have made their case on, if you want to look into the Biden administration regarding weaponization, that's fine. It's okay to look at today, but you can't forget about yesterday if you're going to proceed forward. She doesn't understand this, right? She doesn't understand anything about the case, but she just wants to read off the Trump talking points. So good for her. You know, like I said to everybody on my Twitter account, if you see her on television, change the channel. I don't even know why you'd watch CNN anymore anyway, right? Just stick with us at MSNBC. Stick with us here on Midas Touch Network, right? That's what we need to do. We'll peel everybody off of CNN and we'll put them right over here where you hear nothing but the truth. You hear the facts and you hear it from people who this is not biased. This is not a bias or an animus to Donald Trump. You may have heard me turn around and say when I appeared at the, um, for the grand jury, this is not about revenge. This is about accountability. Because I truly, and I've said this on the show before, I don't want to see Donald or anyone indicted, prosecuted, or convicted simply because I disagree with them. I fundamentally disagree with almost everything that he says. I want to see those people indicted, prosecuted, and convicted because they broke the law. And that's the job of Alvin Bragg. That's the job of the prosecutorial team. That's, that's their job to do. It's my job to provide the information. And if I have to go out onto network, if I have to sit here on our political beatdown and run through it in order that Donald is held accountable or others are held accountable, yeah, fuck yeah, I'm doing it. Alan Weisselberg, Rikers Island. Me, Attorney General Tish James, who did she say was responsible for starting that case? Me, the Trump Organization, 17 counts, right? I was given some credit on that one as well. 
All right. So at the end of the day, a lot of these things came from my testimony before the House Oversight Committee. And guess what, Paula? All that information was accurate, truthful, and has caused now opening of investigations and convictions. So while I'm sitting here and doing something to save democracy, you just sit back there and keep talking. And in your effort to save democracy, to tell the truth, you were locked in solitary confinement for a serious time when Trump weaponized the DOJ because you wanted to write the book, because you wanted to speak the truth. He put you in solitary confinement for, for weeks. I 51 mean, how- days, Ben. 51 days. All right. 51 no, days 51 in solitary days. confinement because you wanted to write the book and tell the truth. So, of course, right now, being able to speak the truth every day after you spend 51 days in solitary confinement is a blessing. And to be able to speak the truth while you're able to is so important and is so courageous. I want you to react now to this uh, uh, interview by Alina Haba, where she attacks you. And frankly, it's not even all that much different than what we just saw on CNN. It shows you how much CNN has fallen. So let me show you this clip of Alina Haba. Then I want to get your reaction. Let's play this clip. It's kind of par for the course, as you said. I'm I'm not as panicked as the media likes to to make this. We knew that they had a DA. We have another Michael Cohen special uh, that's happening here. And this will be the first time ever if they do go ahead and try and indict a former president. Number one, that a former president's been indicted, which is a sad day in our country. And number two, that somebody gets indicted and gets charged with some with being extorted because that is actually what happened let's remember that she wanted payments hush money payments they call them this is something that a lot of people have gone through when when somebody sues them and then they settle a case but this is somebody who creates a story goes and tries to go to the press gets paid by his uh old attorney who advised him so and that let's not forget there was an attorney involved here who did the payment you know and and orchestrated it mr cohen lovely face can't can't wait to see him in court again soon so cohen i want you to react to that but first we got to take this quick break and now let's take a quick break to talk about our next partner fume be smart don't start kick the habit put it out before it puts you out All phrases we've heard a hundred times, and yet we still continue to have bad habits. Now, as you may know, I have a horrible habit of cracking my fingers, and it just frustrates me to no end. Well, our sponsor, Fume, is on a mission to accelerate humanity's breakup from the bad habits that consume far too many of us. Fume is a natural diffusive device that uses plants and behavioral science to help you trade out your negative habit for a positive one. Fume is not a vape. It's a non-electronic device designed to transform your negative habits. Now, instead of pods filled with potentially harmful chemicals like a vape, Fume uses cores infused with plants like peppermint and cinnamon for delicious natural flavors. With an adjustable airflow dial and a magnetic end cap, your fingers will always have something to always do. And I didn't expect much out of Fume when I first got it, but the minty sensation is really powerful and it really hits the back of my throat in a good way. Also, the design is super sleek. My own experience with Fume has been game changing. The easiest way to stop a bad habit is to switch to a positive one and Fume is designed perfectly to do just that. It's Fume's goal to make switching easy and even enjoyable. They have thousands of five-star reviews from people just like you who've successfully switched when other solutions just didn't work. Head to tryfume.com and use code BEAT to save 10% off when you get the Journey Pack today. The Journey Pack comes with three unique flavors and the new version 2 Fume to help you kickstart your positive habits. That's tryfum.com and use code BEAT to save an additional 10% off on your order today. And now back to the video. All right, Cohen, I got to show you this Alina Haba video one more time just to remind our viewers and listeners just how reprehensible and, and idiotic and just strange Alina Haba and Trump's legal team is here. Play this clip that I want your reaction. 
It's kind of par for the course, as you said. I'm, I'm not as panicked as the media likes to, to make this. We knew that they had a DA. We have another Michael Cohen special uh, that's happening here. And this will be the first time ever if they do go ahead and try and indict a former president. Number one, that a former president's been indicted, which is a sad day in our country. And number two, that somebody gets indicted and gets charged with some with being extorted because that is actually what happened let's remember that she wanted payments hush money payments they call them this is something that a lot of people have gone through when when somebody sues them and then they settle a case but this is somebody who creates a story goes and tries to go to the press gets paid by his uh, old attorney who advised right. him so. And that, let's not forget, there was an attorney involved here who did the payment, you know, and, and orchestrated it. Mr. Cohen, lovely face. Can't can't wait to see him in court again soon. Michael Cohen. Yeah. So I think something that Alina seems to be forgetting, and I want to remind all of our brigaders, um, not more than about six weeks ago, Florida-based federal judge has ordered nearly one million in sanctions against Donald Trump and his attorney, Alina Hababababadaba, calling the former president a mastermind of strategic abuse of judicial process. In a blistering 46-page order, U.S. District Court Judge Donald Middlebrook said Trump's sprawling lawsuit against Hillary Clinton and dozens of former Justice Department and FBI officials was an almost cartoonish abuse of the legal system. Here, and this is the quote, here we are confronted with a lawsuit that should never have been filed, which was completely frivolous, both factually and legally, and which was brought in bad faith for an improper purpose. Now, I also want to remind people in the case, in a case that I was suing, uh, that I am still suing Donald Trump, uh, for one of the craziest things, Alina Haba does a motion um, in order to to dismiss the case, and she actually signs the motion as if she's the judge. I mean, this is really a legal beagle, you know. And by the way, you saw also the videos of Stormy Daniels. Stormy Daniels is a nice looking woman. All right, the fact that he could even turn around and say it, it really bothers me that this is what he thinks his base wants to hear. Maybe it is. I don't know. But whatever it is, he's fucking disgusting himself. He's sexist and misogynistic. And you know what? Look, Alina Haba could say whatever she wants. I'm not scared. Of course you're not scared. Right? I'd like to see Donald make that payment of the million dollars on your behalf. Don't be shocked if he makes you pay half of it. Right, Because that's just who he is. And believe me, he's not worried about losing you either. You're no legal genius. So, you know, it'd just be one additional member off the D team. So have a good day. Right. Look at the other lawyers that have gotten fucked as a direct result of Donald. You have, uh, I mean, Eastman. You got Eastman. Austin, you Ooh, have yeah. um, Bob, uh, Christina Bob. You have um what do you call it? me? You have Giuliani. Uh, I mean, how many more? How many more lawyers do you think need to end up getting screwed up? I think there's over a dozen lawyers that have now fallen into that Donald Trump, uh, even Alina Haba. I mean, you are now on the record by a judge saying that your motions, that your complaint were frivolous, cartoonish, is what he turned around and called you a cartoon. So. Before you want to sit there and attack me on truth, holding truth to power to ensure that our democracy continues, that our constitution prevails, and that the biggest fear that our forefathers had is that they would ultimately one day be a president. 44 presidents didn't think this way until we got to number 45, that you don't want to be the president of the United States. You don't want to be there looking out for all Americans, that you want to be a king, a supreme leader, a monarch, a fuhrer. That's what he wants to be. And not while we're around, Ben, not while political beatdown is up, not while we got the Midas Touch Network, not while I'm still breathing. I'm telling you right off the bat, we will continue to hold truth to power every single day. Well, the
The federal judge who wrote the order uh, that you were reading, Judge Donald Middlebrooks, also stated in the order that he believed that it was probably needed for Alina Haba to be referred to a state bar or licensing disciplinary authority because monetary sanctions probably don't go far enough based on the abuse. And I've always predicted that I think in the future, in the not so distant future, Alina Haba is going to be investigated by a state bar disciplinary authority for the conduct that she's engaged in. You have the judicial order saying that she abused judicial processes over and over again, which should kind of be a per se violation. That's just my opinion. But one of the things Alina Haba is saying, she's I'm not afraid. Well, Alina Haba, you're not going to try the case. You, you're not a <laughs> right. trial lawyer. You're not, you're not gonna he, he doesn't put you in to actually do the oral arguments because you're that bad that you can't. So you go on TV, you spread the disinformation, but we did get a glimpse of who apparently is going to be the trial lawyer, Joe let's, Takapina. Let's, go. let's show this one, Ben. Joe let's, Takapina let's go. is going to be the trial lawyer. <laughs> um, should we start off with Good Morning America and George Stephanopoulos? Or Absolutely. should we go to... Let's start, let's start there, and then George. later on, he then goes to attack you. But first, let's just start with uh, George Stephanopoulos, who goes to Takapina, Trump's actual trial lawyer. This is going to be the person who's it's, the one. It's more like it's more like let's go to let's go to George Stephanopoulos schooling Takapina. Let's and play there the are three questions, simple yes no questions mm. at the heart of the case. I want to put them up on the board right there. Number one. Did Trump authorize the payment to Stormy, to Stormy Daniels? Number two, was the payment properly recorded? And number three, was it connected to the election? So let's take all three of them in turn. Number one, did Trump authorize the payment to Stormy Daniels? First of all, all we need to do is start and end with number three, because it's not- Let's answer number one not, first. It's not directly related. Did Trump it's, authorize it's, the payment? It's not directly related. Did Trump authorize George, the payment? It's not directly related to the we'll, campaign. We'll, we'll, it's regardless. We're going to get to that. Uh, uh, well, let's assume he did. For the argument, He's for this actually argument. admitted let's that he did. So the answer to assume, that is yes. Let's assume he did, okay? This was a plain extortion. And I don't know since when we've decided to start prosecuting extortion victims. Um, he's denied, vehemently denied this affair. But he had to pay money because there was going to be uh, an allegation that was going to be publicly embarrassing to him. The vehemently denied the affair part, which, by the way, he did have 1.5 seconds of sex with her, but maybe that doesn't constitute yeah. an affair. But that has maybe nothing, not in Takapita. Yeah, it maybe has maybe nothing not to do with the, it. Has nothing to do with the with the go go. It has nothing to do with the crime. I mean, how about this attack of Pina, right? So Stephanopoulos says, let's start with one, and what he's doing. This guy is this guy marble mouth is going to do wonderful when he's up against the United <laughs> States government, when he's up against his, against district attorneys and, and career prosecutors. He said, like, no, 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 no. Uh, why, why we start? Uh, 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 since when are we prosecuting? When, when, when do we prosecute uh, ex people who get extortion? And, what? Seriously? It's, I mean, know the facts before you go on television, especially when you're dealing with someone like George Stephanopoulos. The guy is a, the guy is a consummate pro. He knows the facts. The guy's a Rhodes Scholar, you idiot. All right? He's a Rhodes Scholar who knows all the facts. And he had time to prepare, as, of course, did Takapina, who decides he's not going to prepare. He's going to come in. See, that's the problem. All of these folks that are now surrounded by Trump. They're basically television tough guys. They go on there spewing what Donald wants to hear. You see, they don't care about facts. They're only playing to a party of one because they think that that party of one is going to actually pay them down the road, which rest assured, he's not going to, right? Especially not for this kind of work. And when, when he loses, he doesn't feel he should pay either. So, look, um, I hope Takapina takes his money in advance. You know, maybe he could get himself some speech elocution lessons or, you know, maybe, I don't know, maybe a towel to wipe off the sweat. He looks like he's sweating something fierce. Oh, and, and then George Stephanopoulos goes, okay, you, you totally bombed point one. Okay, let's go to point two. Was it a uh, entered into the business records falsely? Play this clip.
Was it properly noted in the Trump Organization records, or was a false record made saying this was legal representation? There was absolutely no false records made. To my knowledge, there was no false records made. To your knowledge? Correct. So you're to not sure? Well, I, I wasn't there at the time, but my understanding of these facts is clearly there was no false record but made. But you, you would acknowledge that if a false record was made, that is a crime, a misdemeanor, correct? It, no, I wouldn't acknowledge that any false record made in a private banking record. No, if it were record, made, it is, a, it is a crime. It's a misdemeanor. It depends in what context. <laughs> That's like a really rough. It's cringy to watch. Oh, boy. And this guy passed the bar exam. Amazing. I mean, look. It is. It's not. It is. It's not. You know, it's not. I mean, I mean seriously, this guy's going to do great. This guy's going to do great. You know, George Stephanopoulos schooled him on point one and point two. Schooled him. The guy had nothing to say. Why? Because he knows that Donald is watching and he's playing to a party of one. And so if he acknowledges yes to number two, well, that's a real problem because as he even stated, I don't know. I don't know. It is. It's not. It is. Uh, I, I don't know. It could be. It's not. It may be. I don't know. But it could <laughs> be. Yeah, uh, 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 great. Great job so far. <laughs> take it away, Ben. Let's take it to number three. Well, 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 number three, I, I got too cringed out over that whole thing. But then he, here's the point that he hits on Fox where he tries to hit on number three. And this is the thing. Fox just gives him the softball. So I, I let's just assume I feel bad for – I don't feel bad for but Stephanopoulos crushed him. Let's just watch what happens on element three where he gets to do the talking point the way he wanted, right? Because he wanted with Stephanopoulos not to talk about one and two, just do his three thing. But now here he gets the opportunity to roll out what he tried to do with Stephanopoulos, and he still fails. Play the clip. It actually happened here. President Trump has denied from day one having an affair with this woman. What he is is an extortion victim. And by the way, it's regardless of whether he did or didn't. He says he didn't. I believe him. And the evidence, I think, is very powerful that he never had an affair with her. But more importantly, he's a victim of extortion because she came out right before the campaign and said, or the election and said, unless you pay me, I'm going to make a, a public story about something that he says is completely untrue. So it, it, that's something that would be done irrespective. And here's the key. It would be done irrespective of the campaign, because as Michael Cohen, the convicted perjurer, liar, a guy who has zero credibility, I don't even think he had a law license, quite frankly, honestly, what he said when he pled guilty, Sean, in this case, was that the client, his client, was doing it for to prevent personal embarrassment and pre prevent embarrassment to his family. That takes it out of the realm of exclusively campaign finance. This but is not me... a campaign finance law case at all. <laughs> yeah, there's just so much to say here that I, I truly am embarrassed for him. Well, he didn't have the affair, but even if he did, it doesn't matter regardless. And so, this guy is it pure. He's just, he's just an idiot. I mean, there's no point. It's almost it's almost embarrassing as a lawyer, a former lawyer. Yes, I've been disbarred. Yes, I did pass the bar. In fact, you fool, I happen to have been the personal attorney to your former client, right? Or to your current client, my former client. So yes, I was a lawyer. Yes, I made certain mistakes. I sure did. All right. But at the end of the day, he's making them every time he opens his mouth. He has no knowledge of anything. And yes, you can go on Fox News and bullshit the people who want to be lied to. We saw that with fucker Carlson. We saw that with Hannity and Ingraham. They just lie to their viewers day in and day out. And they don't give a shit about, you know, about the lie because their people suck up that lie. Yeah, Donald didn't sleep with her. He's being extorted. Fuck this, right? Cohen's no good. He's a convicted liar, right? He's a perjurer. He's... You know, he should have known all of these arguments fail and they fail miserably on their face. They're not predicated in fact. They're not predicated in law. They're just predicated on, again, appeasing a party of one. And appeasing Donald Trump is not a defense to a case. And look, we expect that from Fox, right? You know, unfortunately, when CNN's view of their business model is we need to look more like Fox is just a complete 
misread. It is a complete betrayal. But frankly, here at the Midas Touch Network, I say, good, bring it on. I'm getting all their viewers going. They're coming, their political beatdown viewers. So, so keep doing that, I guess, CNN. Hey, could you because- imagine that you have sitting at a table talking about this? You have Donald, Don Jr., and Takapina, right? So here we go. So you got, <laughs> I don't know what they're saying. Quite frankly, I wouldn't sleep with horse face. I, I, I don't like her. She don't like me. I didn't do it. And so, my dad says I didn't do anything. <laughs> Case over. We won. Yeah, go, go, go on, GMA. Go on, Good Morning America. Go. You got your... You got, you got Could your, you imagine you got, this? We're Saturday Night Live when we need them. I mean, this is just classic great shit. I mean, this is just, and then you'll have Kimberly, you know, Gargoyle sitting back there, right? And all of a sudden she'll be like, the best is yet to come, right? And all of a sudden you'll see Donald walk out in his tidy whities I mean, this is just absolute, this is great fodder for something like Saturday Night Live. It is an absolute joke. It is a shit show, but it's sad. It's like, it's, it's like what they call a train wreck, right? You can't drive past the car crash or the train wreck without looking, without being mesmerized. Every day, there's more and more stupidity coming out of that group. And we're just, we've almost become like a, you know, a um, a reality show nation where this is a reality show. And if this was on like a Bravo station, it would be the number one show on television ever because you can't not watch it. It's that fucking ridiculous. And the players that are there are more ridiculous than even the person that they're supposed to be representing, which is hard to imagine. You know, and and that's why, though, when we cover what's taking place, I'm not afraid. You're not afraid here at the network to cover what is going on with Donald Trump. It's how you cover it to me is the key. And the moment you start normalizing that behavior and you treat it like normal political conduct and discourse, to me, you're doing the same danger, frankly, as what Fox is doing. So earlier in the show, for example, we showed this Associated Press headline. um, And I will show you, Trump returns to Iowa aiming for more disciplined campaign. I don't know if we have any of the text from this article, but it goes on to basically treat this thing like like it's like it's normal, right? As Trump returns to Iowa on Monday, he and his team are aiming for a more disciplined approach. They're particularly focused on building the building the data and digital engagement that he's going to persuade Iowans. And then it goes through his swing state tour through the eastern city of Davenport. It marks his first appearance. Then it goes on. Trump on Monday is going to deliver what has been billed as an education policy speech, but he's expected to touch more broadly on his accomplishments as president and his agenda for another term, including trade policies and agriculture, according to a person familiar with his plans who spoke on a condition of anonymity to preview his remarks. Like, to me, in many ways, that is just equally journalistic malpractice to put that as an associated press story. As Tucker, as Ingraham, as Hannity, as any of the things that we've seen at Fox, because it normalizes it. Like we want to see what really went down in Iowa. We want to see if this is this is normal. This is Trump from Iowa saying that he wants to get rid of the woke. Here, play this clip. If we have the clip, we'll get the clip. Um, let's play something. Let, let's play some of the. Well, let me show you the clip from CPAC, though, at least, where this is what he talks about when they want to make it look like this is a normal party. This is him talking about uh, uh, Stormy Daniels and the case against them. Play this clip. To bring charges against me for now ancient, no affair story of Stormy Horseface Daniels. No attraction. <laughs> no affair. I call it no affair. Where there's no crime anyway. And, and here's another one where him talking about, and I think we have this one, Salty. You know what's really said there, Ben, before we go to the next clip? What's really said there 
is that this asshole thinks that you can disparage a woman in such a grotesque manner and do it in a public setting the way that he did. And what makes it equally, if not more gross, the fact that fucking people are laughing and clapping this moron on for something like that. You know, it's it's despicable behavior. And it's exactly why nobody showed up to CPAC anyway. He was talking to empty chairs. And and speaking about talking to empty chairs at CPAC, here's the other thing he said addressing the criminal investigation. While he says he's really good at words, right? I know I'm the best with words, whatever that means. He goes, I've never heard of the word subpoena before. That's part of his defense as well. That these are new words to him. Here, play this clip. Oh, amazing. <laughs> what the hell did you get me into? Grand jury, those words, grand jury. I didn't know that they want to lynch you for doing nothing wrong. I didn't know they want to lynch you for doing a great job. I didn't know they want to put you away because your poll numbers are better than anybody they've seen in years. And I'll just show you another one. This is from Iowa. This is what the AP was like. This is the discipline speech. This is what he talks about with, with woke or whatever. Play this clip. Together, we will end the era of weaponized government forever. We will end woke. We will crush the deep state. We will he doesn't even know what the word woke means. That's the funny thing. His understanding of the word is exactly opposite. He doesn't understand that it's an African-American vernacular that really talks about um, it's, it's understanding prejudice and discrimination. He has no idea what it's about. He, I mean, it's, it's incredible that somebody as ignorant as this orange-crusted Mandarin Mussolini can go ahead and get out there and literally have won an election to be the president of the United States of America. He is by far the dumbest president that this country has ever had. And will ever have. And, and, crazy. and it's, it really is. And, and here's from the same Iowa speech that uh, Associated Press was saying, discipline, discipline. This is Trump saying that uh, he, he's attacking DeSantis, which, by the way, let them attack each other. Let these two want to be fascists attack each other, who was a disciple of Paul Ryan, the former Republican Speaker of the House. And then he goes and calls Paul Ryan a loser. Then I want to make the broader point here about what's become of the Republican Party, I think, is, is, is an important point that we need to close the show out with because it goes to this systemic uh, corrosion of our politics. Here, just play this clip first, though. We're leaving the age where we But you have to remember, Ron was a disciple of Paul Ryan who is a rhino loser who currently is destroying Fox and would constantly vote against entitlements. He would just vote against, remember that, the wheelchair over the cliffs, the Democrats used it. The wheelchair over the cliff commercial, very effective. That was about him. But Ryan, Paul Ryan's a big reason that Mitt Romney, I'm not a big fan of Mitt Romney, lost his election. And to be honest with you, Ron reminds me a lot of Mitt Romney. So. I don't think you're going to be doing so well here, but we're going to find out. But those are the facts. But I'm proud to say the final number. So what do you have to do now to become a Republican in 2023? Like, like, what does that actually mean? Well, this comes from the official GOP account as we are recording this live. This is what the GOP just put out. They wrote, first, it was gas cars then gas stoves. Now, Democrats are looking at going after washing machines. The left wants us to make us lock down at home, eat bugs, and wash our clothes in the river, all in the name of climate. And look, Paul Ryan is a loser, though, because he didn't stand up to Donald Trump. In fact, he enabled this to happen where you now have a Republican party. And by the way, in a multi-party system where there's vigorous discourse and debate about real issues, 
serious issues, I welcome that. I want yeah, there to know, be. Ben, I got to tell you, I don't want to see. Yeah, I don't want to see Donald eating bugs. Uh, on behalf of all the brigaders, and I know they're going to agree with me, you as well. We all want him to eat shit. I I I, I couldn't agree more. And then when you read that, though, when you see that you know we're talking about here justice, we're talking about here jobs, we're talking about healthcare, we're talking about education, we're talking about our veterans, we're talking about make sure a woman can control her own body, we're talking about equal rights. We're talking Gun about control. these issues. We're talking about we're talking about the things that really matter. Do you not want to leave an earth for your grandkids, your great grandkids, and future generations? You know, the number one killer of children today. No, nope, not cancer, not car accidents, gun violence, right? But sensible gun legislation off the table. Climate off the table, right? Let's roll back a couple more ideas, Donald, right? So that you have, you know, loose legislation so, or loose regulation so that you can have more of these derailments, you know, going on and polluting the earth. He's so stupid. He has no idea. Let's get rid of the, you know, the FDA. Let's get rid of the EPA. Let's get rid of everything. I mean, let's get rid of Dodd-Frank. What... Let's get rid of the regulations on banks that were enacted due to banking crises and yeah. let's then allow SVB to happen. And then when Silicon Valley bank happens, let's go. It's the woke. It's the woke. No, it's, it's, it's the woke Joe Biden. And it's the woke Joe Biden and Hunter. It's all about Hunter. Okay. And end of story. Ah. I think people are, I think people are starting to, that 65% of people who are repulsed by Trump, I think that's growing. And I think it's just important that we continue the work we're doing here on the political beatdown and all the brigade who watches this spread these messages of justice, of hope, of compassion, of intelligence, of data. That is so critical right now. And we are so grateful to all of the brigade out there because this isn't just a we do a podcast and, and people watch. This is an interactive community in the brigade where we are in this together. And all of you watching and listening to this are just as critical to us who are on this podcast. And we are so grateful for each and every one of you. Cohen, I know you are heading tomorrow again into the uh, to testify before the grand jury. Um, do you have any final words generally on today's episode to the brigade? No, nope. other than just stay tuned. Join us on Thursday. Tell your friends. Join the brigade. Let them know. You know, we are doing, interestingly enough, better than CNN, right, in terms of overall viewership numbers. And so as we continue to grow, our next move is going to be to put some uh, event on where we will let you know exactly where we are, what we're doing, and looking forward to having an opportunity to meeting each and every one of you. Cohen, you give me hope. You make me laugh. You give me courage. And um, just so I have so much fun hosting this with you and spending this time with you and all of the brigade. Thank you for watching. Make sure, Good. just do me one favor. Make sure that you read Revenge, the single most important thing I ask you to do. Read Revenge. You will understand the journey that's gotten me to where I am. You'll understand the weaponization by Donald Trump and Bill Barr of the Justice Department and what can happen to you. It's so important. It's probably the most important read that you will have in 2023. And make sure that you follow me on social media and watch and listen to Mea Culpa podcast. You'll get more of this. But make sure, most importantly, you're back here on Thursday for me and Ben. We also have the audio podcast here at Political Beatdown. So not only subscribe to the YouTube channel, subscribe to Political Beatdown Audio, subscribe to the Mea Culpa audio podcast as well to get your full dose of Michael Cohen. Make sure you listen to that all. Yeah. And we'll see you here on Thursday on the Political Beatdown. I'm Ben Mycel, is joined by Michael Cohen. Shout out to the Midas Mighty. <laughs>